Section 34 of The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Of Made Wines, Brewing, French Bread, Muffins, etc. To Make Raisin Wine Take two hundred of raisins, stalks and all, and put them into a large hogshead, fill it with water, let them steep a fortnight, stirring them every day. Then pour off all the liquor, and press the raisins. Put both liquors together in a nice clean vessel that will just hold it, for it must be full. Let it stand till it has done hissing or making the least noise, then stop it close and let it stand six months. Peg it, and if you find it quite clear, rack it off in another vessel. Stop it close, and let it stand three months longer. Then bottle it, and when you use it, rack it off into a decanter. To make elder wine. Pick the elderberries when full ripe, put them into a stone jar, and set them in the oven, or a kettle of boiling water till the jar is hot through then take them out and strain them through a coarse cloth wringing the berries and put the juice into a clean kettle to every quart of juice put a pound of fine lisbon sugar let it boil and skim it well when it is clear and fine pour it into a jar when cold cover it close and keep it till you make raisin wine then when you tun up your wine to every gallon of wine put half a pint of the elder syrup to make orange wine take twelve pounds of the best powder sugar with the whites of eight or ten eggs well beaten into six gallons of spring water and boil three quarters of an hour when cold put into it six spoonfuls of yeast and the juice of twelve lemons which being pared must stand with two pounds of white sugar in a tankard and in the morning skim off the top and then put it into the water then add the juice and rinds of fifty oranges but not the white parts of the rinds and so let it work all together two days and two nights then add two quarts of Rhenish or white wine and put it into your vessel to make orange wine with raisins take thirty pounds of new malaga raisins picked clean chop them small take twenty large seville oranges ten of them you must pare as thin as for preserving boil about eight gallons of soft water till a third be consumed let it cool a little then put five gallons of it hot upon your raisins and orange peel stir it well together cover it up and when it is cold let it stand five days stirring it once or twice a day then pass it through a hair sieve and with a spoon press it as dry as you can put it in a runlet fit for it and put to it the rind of the other ten oranges cut as thin as the first then make a syrup of the juice of twenty oranges with a pound of white sugar it must be made the day before you tun it up stir it well together and stop it close let it stand two months to clear then bottle it up it will keep three years and is better for keeping to make elderflower wine very like frontiniac take six gallons of spring water twelve pounds of white sugar six pounds of raisins of the sun chopped boil these together one hour then take the flowers of elder when they are falling and rub them off to the quantity of half a peck when the liquor is cold put them in the next day put in the juice of three lemons and four spoonfuls of good ale yeast let it stand covered up two days then strain it off and put it in a vessel fit for it to every gallon of wine put a quart of rhenish and put your bung lightly on a fortnight then stop it down close let it stand six months 
and if you find it is fine bottle it off to make gooseberry wine gather your gooseberries in dry weather when they are half ripe pick them and bruise a peck in a tub with a wooden mallet then take a horsehair cloth and press them as much as possible without breaking the seeds when you have pressed out all the juice to every gallon of gooseberries put three pounds of fine dry powder sugar stir it all together till the sugar is dissolved then put it in a vessel or cask which must be quite full if ten or twelve gallons let it stand a fortnight if a twenty gallon cask five weeks set it in a cool place then draw it off from the lees clear the vessel of the lees and pour in the clear liquor again if it be a ten gallon cask let it stand three months if a twenty gallon four months then bottle it off to make currant wine gather your currants on a fine dry day when the fruit is full ripe strip them put them in a large pan and bruise them with a wooden pestle let them stand in a pan or tub twenty-four hours to ferment then run it through a hair sieve and do not let your hand touch the liquor to every gallon of this liquor put two pounds and a half of white sugar stir it well together and put it into your vessel to every six gallons put in a quart of brandy and let it stand six weeks if it is fine bottle it if it is not draw it off as clear as you can into another vessel or large bottles and in a fortnight bottle it in small bottles to make cherry wine pull your cherries when full ripe off the stalks and press them through a hair sieve to every gallon of liquor put two pounds of lump sugar beat fine stir it together and put it into a vessel it must be full when it has done working and making any noise stop it close for three months and bottle it off to make birch wine the season for procuring the liquor from the birch trees is in the beginning of march while the sap is rising and before the leaves shoot out for when the sap is come forward and the leaves appear the juice by being long digested in the bark grows thick and coloured which before was thin and clear the method of procuring the juice is by boring holes in the body of the tree and putting in soffits which are commonly made of the branches of elder the pith being taken out you may without hurting the tree if large tap it in several places four or five at a time and by that means save from a good many trees several gallons every day if you have not enough in one day the bottles in which it drops must be corked close and rosined or waxed however make use of it as soon as you can take the sap and boil it as long as any scum rises skimming it all the time to every gallon of liquor put four pounds of good sugar the thin peel of a lemon boil it afterwards half an hour skimming it very well pour it into a clean tub and when it is almost cold set it to work with the yeast spread upon a toast let it stand five or six days stirring it often then take such a cask as will hold the liquor fire a large match dipped in brimstone and throw it into the cask stop it close till the match is extinguished tun your wine lay the bung on light till you find it has done working stop it close and keep it three months then bottle it off to make quince wine gather the quinces when dry and full ripe take twenty large quinces wipe them clean with a coarse cloth and grate them with a large grate or rasp as near the core as you can but none of the core boil a gallon of spring water throw in your quinces let it boil softly about a quarter of an hour 
then strain them well into an earthen pan on two pounds of double refined sugar pare the peel of two large lemons throw in and squeeze the juice through a sieve stir it about till it is very cool then toast a little bit of bread very thin and brown rub a little yeast on it let it stand close covered twenty four hours then take out the toast and lemon put it up in a cag keep it three months and then bottle it if you make a twenty gallon cask let it stand six months before you bottle it when you strain your quinces you are to wring them hard in a coarse cloth to make cowslip or clary wine take six gallons of water twelve pounds of sugar the juice of six lemons the whites of four eggs beat very well put all together in a kettle let it boil half an hour skim it very well take a peck of cowslips if dry ones half a peck put them into a tub with the thin peeling of six lemons then pour on the boiling liquor and stir them about when almost cold put in a thin toast baked dry and rubbed with yeast let it stand two or three days to work if you put in before you tun it six ounces of syrup of citron or lemons with a quart of rhenish wine it will be a great addition the third day strain it off and squeeze the cowslips through a coarse cloth then strain it through a flannel bag and tun it up lay the bung loose for two or three days to see if it works and if it does not bung it down tight let it stand three months then bottle it to make turnip wine take a good many turnips pare slice and put them in a cider press and press out all the juice very well to every gallon of juice have three pounds of lump sugar have a vessel ready just big enough to hold the juice put your sugar into a vessel and also to every gallon of juice half a pint of brandy pour in the juice and lay something over the bung for a week to see if it works if it does you must not bung it down till it has done working then stop it close for three months and draw it off in another vessel when it is fine bottle it off to make raspberry wine take some fine raspberries bruise them with the back of a spoon then strain them through a flannel bag into a stone jar to each quart of juice put a pound of double refined sugar stir it well together and cover it close let it stand three days then pour it off clear to a quart of juice put two quarts of white wine bottle it off it will be fit to drink in a week brandy made thus is a very fine dram and a much better way than steeping the raspberries rules for brewing care must be taken in the first place to have the malt clean and after it is ground it ought to stand four or five days for strong october five quarters of malt to three hogsheads and twenty-four pounds of hops this will afterwards make two hogsheads of good keeping small beer allowing five pounds of hops to it for middling beer a quarter of malt makes a hogshead of ale and one of small beer or it will make three hogsheads of good small beer allowing eight pounds of hops this will keep all the year or it will make twenty gallons of strong ale and two hogsheads of small beer that will keep all the year if you intend your ale to keep a great while allow a pound of hops to every bushel if to keep six months five pounds to a hogshead if for present drinking three pounds to a hogshead and the softest and clearest water you can get observe the day before to have all your vessels very clean and never use your tubs for any other use except to make wines let your casks be very clean the day before with boiling water and if your bung is big enough 
scrub them well with a little birch broom or brush but if they be very bad take out the heads and let them be scrubbed clean with a hand brush sand and fuller's earth put on the head again and scald them well throw into the barrel a piece of unslacked lime and stop the bung close the first copper of water when it boils pour into your mash tub and let it be cool enough to see your face in then put in your malt and let it be well mashed have a copper of water boiling in the meantime and when your malt is well mashed fill your mashing tub stir it well again and cover it over with the sacks let it stand three hours set a broad shallow tub under the cock let it run very softly and if it is thick throw it up again till it runs fine then throw a handful of hops in the under tub let the mash run into it and fill your tubs till all is run off have water boiling in the copper and lay as much more on as you have occasion for allowing one third for boiling and waste let that stand an hour boiling more water to fill the mash tub for small beer let the fire down a little and put it into tubs enough to fill your mash let the second mash be run off and fill your copper with the first wort put in part of your hops and make it boil quick about an hour is long enough when it is half boiled throw in a handful of salt have a clean white wand and dip it into the copper and if the wort feels clammy it is boiled enough then slacken your fire and take off your wort have ready a large tub put two sticks across and set your straining basket over the tub on the sticks and strain your wort through it put your other wort on to boil with the rest of the hops let your mash be covered again with water and thin your wort that is cooled in as many things as you can for the thinner it lies and the quicker it cools the better when quite cool put it into the tunning tub throw a handful of salt into every boil when the mash has stood an hour draw it off then fill your mash with cold water take off the wort in the copper and order it as before when cool add to it the first in the tub so soon as you empty one copper fill the other so boil your small beer well let the last mash run off and when both are boiled with fresh hops order them as the two first boilings when cool empty the mash tub and put the small beer to work there when cool enough work it set a wooden bowl full of yeast in the beer and it will work over with a little of the beer in the boil stir your tun up every twelve hours let it stand two days then tun it taking off the yeast fill your vessels full and save some to fill your barrels let it stand till it is done working then lay on your bung lightly for a fortnight after that stop it as close as you can mind you have a vent peg at the top of the vessel in warm weather open it and if your drink hisses as it often will loosen till it has done then stop it close again if you can boil your ale in one boiling it is best if your copper will allow of it if not boil it as conveniency serves when you come to draw your beer and find it is not fine draw off a gallon and set it on the fire with two ounces of isinglass cut small and beat dissolve it in the beer over the fire when it is all melted let it stand till it is cold and pour it in at the bung which must lay loose on till it has done fermenting then stop it close for a month take great care your casks are not musty or have any ill taste if they have it is a hard thing to sweeten them you are to wash your casks with cold water before you scald them and they should lie a day or two soaking and clean them well then scald them the best thing for rope 
mix two handfuls of bean flour and one handful of salt throw this into a kilderkin of beer do not stop it close till it has done fermenting then let it stand a month and draw it off but sometimes nothing will do with it when a barrel of beer has turned sour to a kilderkin of beer throw in at the bung a quart of oatmeal lay the bung on loose two or three days then stop it down close and let it stand a month some throw in a piece of chalk as big as a turkey's egg and when it is done working stop it close for a month then tap it baking to make white bread after the london way take a bushel of the finest flour well dressed put it in the kneading trough at one end take a gallon of water which we call liquor and some yeast stir it into the liquor till it looks of a good brown colour and begins to curdle strain and mix it with your flour till it is about the thickness of a seed cake then cover it with the lid of the trough and let it stand three hours and as soon as you see it begin to fall take a gallon more of liquor weigh three quarters of a pound of salt and with your hand mix it well with the water strain it and with this liquor make your dough of a moderate thickness fit to make up into loaves then cover it again with the lid and let it stand three hours more in the meantime put the wood into the oven and heat it it will take two hours heating when your sponge has stood its proper time clear the oven and begin to make your bread set it in the oven and close it up and three hours will bake it when once it is in you must not open the oven till the bread is baked and observe in summer that your water be milk warm and in winter as hot as you can bear your finger in it note as to the quantity of liquor your dough will take experience will teach you in two or three times making for all flour does not want the same quantity of liquor and if you make any quantity it will raise up the lid and run over to make french bread take three quarts of water and one of milk in winter scalding hot in summer a little more than milk warm season it well with salt then take a pint and a half of good ale yeast not bitter lay it in a gallon of water the night before pour it off the water stir in your yeast into the milk and water then with your hand break in a little more than a quarter of a pound of butter work it well till it is dissolved then beat up two eggs in a basin and stir them in have about a peck and a half of flour mix it with your liquor in winter make your dough pretty stiff in summer more slack so that you may use a little more or less of flour according to the stiffness of your dough mix it well but the less you work the better make it into rolls and have a very quick oven when they have lain about a quarter of an hour turn them on the other side let them lie about a quarter longer take them out and chip all your french bread with a knife which is better than rasping it and makes it look spongy and of a fine yellow whereas the rasping takes off all that fine colour and makes it look too smooth you must stir your liquor into the flour as you do for pie crust after your dough is made cover it with a cloth and let it lie to rise while the oven is heating to make muffins and oat cakes to a bushel of hertfordshire white flour take a pint and a half of good ale yeast from pale malt if you can get it because it is the whitest let the yeast lie in water all night the next day pour off the water clear make two gallons of water just milk warm not to scold your yeast and two ounces of salt mix your water yeast and salt well together for about a quarter of an hour then strain it and mix up your dough as light as possible 
and let it lie in your trough an hour to rise then with your hand roll it and pull it into little pieces about as big as a large walnut roll them with your hand like a ball lay them on your table and as fast as you do them lay a piece of flannel over them and be sure to keep your dough covered with flannel when you have rolled out all your dough begin to bake the first and by that time they will be spread out in the right form lay them on your iron as one side begins to change colour turn the other take great care they do not burn or be too much discoloured but that you will be a judge of in two or three makings take care the middle of the iron is not too hot as it will be but then you may put a brick bat or two in the middle of the fire to slacken the heat the thing you bake on must be made thus build a place as if it was going to set a copper and in the stead of a copper a piece of iron all over the top fixed in form just the same as the bottom of an iron pot and make your fire underneath with coal as in a copper observe muffins are made the same way only this when you pull them to pieces roll them in a good deal of flour and with a rolling pin roll them thin cover them with a piece of flannel and they will rise to a proper thickness and if you find them too big or too little you must roll dough accordingly these must not be the least discoloured when you eat them toast them crisp on both sides then with your hand pull them open and they will be like a honeycomb lay in as much butter as you intend to use then clap them together again and set it by the fire when you think the butter is melted turn them that both sides may be buttered alike but do not touch them with a knife either to spread or cut them open if you do they will be as heavy as lead only when they are buttered and done you may cut them across with a knife note some flour will soak up a quart or three pints more water than other flour then you must add more water or shake in more flour in making up for the dough must be as light as possible a receipt for making bread without balm by the help of a leaven take a lump of dough about two pounds of your last making which has been raised by balm keep it by you in a wooden vessel and cover it well with flour this is your leaven then the night before you intend to bake put the said leaven to a peck of flour and work them well together with warm water let it lie in a dry wooden vessel well covered with a linen cloth and a blanket and keep it in a warm place this dough kept warm will rise again next morning and will be sufficient to mix with two or three bushels of flour being worked up with warm water and a little salt when it is well worked up and thoroughly mixed with all the flour let it be well covered with the linen and blanket until you find it rise then knead it well and work it up into bricks or loaves making the loaves broad and not so thick and high as is frequently done by which means the bread will be better baked then bake your bread always keep by you two or more pounds of the dough of your last baking well covered with flour to make leaven to serve from one baking day to another the more leaven is put to the flour the lighter and spongier the bread will be the fresher the leaven the bread will be the less sour from the dublin society a method to preserve a large stock of yeast which will keep and be of use for several months either to make bread or cakes when you have yeast in plenty take a quantity of it stir and work it well with a whisk until it becomes liquid and thin then get a large wooden platter cooler or tub clean and dry and with a soft brush lay a thin layer of the yeast on the tub and turn the mouth downwards that no dust may fall upon it but so the air may get under to dry it 
when that coat is very dry then lay on another till you have a sufficient quantity even two or three inches thick to serve for several months always taking care the yeast in the tub be very dry before you lay more on when you have occasion to use this yeast cut a piece off and lay it in warm water stir it together and it will be fit for use if it is for brewing take a large handful of birch tied together and dip it into the yeast and hang it up to dry take great care no dust comes to it and so you may do as many as you please when your beer is fit to set to work throw in one of these and it will make it work as well as if you had fresh yeast you must whip it about in the wort and then let it lie when the vat works well take out the broom and dry it again and it will do for the next brewing note in the building of your oven for baking observe that you make it round low roofed and a little mouth then it will take less fire and keep in the heat better than a long oven and high roofed and will bake the bread better end of section thirty four section thirty five of the art of cookery made plain and easy by hannah glass this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen jarring cherries and preserves etc to jar cherries lady north's way take twelve pounds of cherries stone them put them in your preserving pan with three pounds of double refined sugar and a quart of water then set them on the fire till they are scalding hot take them off a little while and set them on the fire again boil them till they are tender then sprinkle them with half a pound of double refined sugar pounded and skim them clean put them all together in a china bowl let them stand in the syrup three days drain them through a sieve and take them out one by one with the holes downwards on a wicker sieve then set them in a stove to dry and as they dry turn them upon clean sieves when they are dry enough put a clean white sheet of paper in a preserving pan then put all the cherries in with another clean white sheet of paper on the top of them cover them close with a cloth and set them over a cool fire till they sweat take them off the fire then let them stand till they are cold and put them in boxes or jars to keep to dry cherries to four pounds of cherries put one pound of sugar and just put as much water to the sugar as will wet it when it is melted make it boil stone your cherries put them in and make them boil skim them two or three times take them off and let them stand in the syrup two or three days then boil your syrup and put to them again but do not boil your cherries any more let them stand three or four days longer then take them out lay them in sieves to dry and lay them in the sun or in a slow oven to dry when dry lay them in rows in papers and sew a row of cherries and a row of white paper in boxes to preserve cherries with the leaves and stalks green first dip the stalks and leaves in the best vinegar boiling hot stick the sprig upright in a sieve till they are dry in the meantime boil some double refined sugar to syrup and dip the cherries stalks and leaves in the syrup and just let them scald lay them on a sieve and boil the sugar to a candy height then dip the cherries stalks leaves and all then stick the branches in sieves and dry them as you do other sweetmeats they look very pretty at candlelight in a dessert to make orange marmalade take the clearest seville oranges and cut them in two take out all the pulp and juice into a pan and pick all the skins and seeds out boil the rinds in hard water till they are very tender 
and change the water three times while they are boiling and then pound them in a mortar and put in the juice and pulp put them in a preserving pan with double their weight of loaf sugar set it over a slow fire boil it gently forty minutes put it into pots cover it with brandy paper and tie it down close to make white marmalade pare and core the quinces as fast as you can then take to a pound of quinces being cut in pieces less than half quarters three quarters of a pound of double refined sugar beat small then throw half the sugar on the raw quinces set it on a slow fire till the sugar is melted and the quinces tender then put in the rest of the sugar and boil it up as fast as you can when it is almost enough put in some jelly and boil it apace then put it up and when it is quite cold cover it with white paper to make red marmalade take full ripe quinces pare and cut them in quarters and core them put them in a saucepan cover them with the parings fill the saucepan nearly full of spring water cover it close and stew them gently till they are quite soft and a deep pink colour then pick out the quince from the parings and beat them to a pulp in a mortar take their weight in loaf sugar put in as much of the water they were boiled in as will dissolve it and boil and skim it well put in your quinces and boil them gently three quarters of an hour keep stirring them all the time or it will stick to the pan and burn put it into flat pots and when cold tie it down close to preserve oranges whole take the best bermudas or seville oranges you can get and pare them with a penknife very thin and lay your oranges in water three or four days shifting them every day then put them in a kettle with fair water and put a board on them to keep them down in the water and have a skillet on the fire with water that may be ready to supply the kettle with boiling water as it wastes it must be filled up three or four times while the oranges are doing for they will take up seven or eight hours boiling they must be boiled till a white straw will run through them then take them out and scoop the seeds out of them very carefully by making a little hole in the top and weigh them to every pound of oranges put a pound and three quarters of double refined sugar beat well and sifted through a clean lawn sieve fill your oranges with sugar and strew some on them let them lie a little while and make your jelly thus take two dozen of pippins or john apples and slice them into water and when they are boiled tender strain the liquor from the pulp and to every pound of oranges you must have a pint and a half of this liquor and put to it three quarters of the sugar you left in filling the oranges set it on the fire and let it boil skim it well and put it in a clean earthen pan till it is cold then put it in your skillet put in your oranges with a small bodkin job your oranges as they are boiling to let the syrup into them strew on the rest of your sugar whilst they are boiling and when they look clear take them up and put them into your glasses put one in a glass just fit for them and boil the syrup till it is almost a jelly then fill up your glasses when they are cold paper them up and keep them in a dry place or thus cut a hole out of the stalk end of your orange as big as a sixpence scoop out all the pulp very clean tie them singly in muslin and lay them two days in spring water change the water twice a day and boil them in the muslin till tender be careful you keep them covered with water weigh the oranges before you scoop them to every pound add two pounds of double refined sugar and a pint of water boil the sugar and water with the orange juice to a syrup skim it well let it stand till it is cold take the oranges out of the muslin and put them in 
and boil them till they are quite clear and put them by till cold then pare and core some green pippins and boil them in water till it is very strong of the pippin do not stir them put them down gently with the back of a spoon and strain the liquor through a jelly bag till it is clear put to every pint of liquor a pound of double refined sugar and the juice of a lemon strained as clear as you can boil it to a strong jelly drain the oranges out of your syrup and put them in glass or white stone jars of the size of the orange and pour the jelly on them cover them with brandy papers and tie them over with a bladder you may do lemons in the same manner quinces whole take your quinces and pare them cut them in quarters or leave them whole which you please put them into a saucepan and cover them with hard water lay your parings over them to keep them under water cover your saucepan close that no steam can come out set them over a slow fire till they are soft and a fine pink colour then let them stand till cold make a syrup of double refined sugar with as much water as will wet it boil and skim it well put in your quinces let them boil ten minutes take them off and let them stand three hours then boil them till the syrup is thick and the quinces clear then put them in deep jars and when cold put brandy paper over them and tie them down close to make conserve of red roses or any other flowers take rosebuds or any other flowers and pick them cut off the white part from the red and put the red flowers and sift them through a sieve to take out the seeds then weigh them and to every pound of flowers take two pounds and a half of loaf sugar beat the flowers pretty fine in a stone mortar then by degrees put the sugar to them and beat it very well till it is well incorporated together then put it into gallipots tie it over with paper over that a leather and it will keep seven years to make conserve of hips gather hips before they grow soft cut off the heads and stalks slit them in halves take out all the seeds and white that is in them very clean then put them into an earthen pan and stir them every day or they will grow mouldy let them stand till they are soft enough to rub them through a coarse hair sieve as the pulp comes take it off the sieve they are a dry berry and will require pains to rub them through then add its weight in sugar mix them well together without boiling and keep it in deep gallipots for use to make syrup of roses infuse three pounds of damask rose leaves in a gallon of warm water in a well glazed earthen pot with a narrow mouth for eight hours which stop so close that none of the virtue may exhale when they have infused so long heat the water again squeeze them out and put in three pounds more of rose leaves to infuse for eight hours more then press them out very hard then to every quart of this infusion add four pounds of fine sugar and boil it to a syrup to make syrup of citron pare and slice your citrons thin lay them in a basin with layers of fine sugar the next day pour off the liquor into a glass skim it and clarify it over a gentle fire to make syrup of clove gilly flowers clip your gilly flowers sprinkle them with fair water put them into an earthen pot stop it up very close set it in a kettle of water and let it boil for two hours then strain out the juice put a pound and a half of sugar to a pint of juice put it into a skillet set it on the fire keep it stirring till the sugar is all melted do not let it boil then set it by to cool and put it into bottles to make syrup of peach blossoms 
infuse peach blossoms in hot water as much as will handsomely cover them let them stand in balneo or in sand for twenty-four hours covered close then strain out the flowers from the liquor and put in fresh flowers let them stand to infuse as before then strain them out and to the liquor put fresh peach blossoms the third time and if you please a fourth time then to every pound of your infusion add two pounds of double refined sugar and setting it in sand or balneo make a syrup which keep for use to make syrup of quinces great quinces pass their pulp through a cloth to extract the juice set their juices in the sun to settle or before the fire and by that means clarify it for every four ounces of this juice take a pound of sugar boiled brown if the putting in the juice of the quinces should check the boiling of the sugar too much give the syrup some boiling till it becomes pearled then take it off the fire and when cold put it into the bottles to preserve apricots take your apricots stone and pare them thin and take their weight in double refined sugar beaten and sifted put your apricots in a silver cup or tankard cover them over with sugar and let them stand so all night the next day put them in a preserving pan set them on a gentle fire and let them simmer a little while then let them boil till tender and clear taking them off sometimes to turn and skim keep them under the liquor as they are doing and with a small clean bodkin or great needle job them that the syrup may penetrate into them when they are enough take them up and put them in glasses boil and skim your syrup and when it is cold put it on your apricots put brandy paper over and tie them close to preserve damsons whole you must take some damsons and cut them in pieces put them in a skillet over the fire with as much water as will cover them when they are boiled and the liquor pretty strong strain it out add for every pound of the damsons wiped clean a pound of single refined sugar put the third part of your sugar into the liquor set it over the fire and when it simmers put in the damsons let them have one good boil and take them off for half an hour covered up close then set them on again and let them simmer over the fire after turning them then take them out and put them in a basin strew all the sugar that was left on them and pour the hot liquor over them cover them up and let them stand till next day then boil them up again till they are enough take them up and put them in pots boil the liquor till it jellies and pour it on them when it is almost cold so paper them up to candy any sort of flowers take the best treble refined sugar break it into lumps and dip it piece by piece into water put them into a vessel of silver and melt them over the fire when it just boils strain it and set it on the fire again then let it boil till it draws in hairs which you may perceive by holding up your spoon then put in the flowers and set them in cups or glasses when it is of a hard candy break it in lumps and lay it as high as you please dry it in a stove or in the sun and it will look like sugar candy to preserve gooseberries whole without stoning take the largest preserving gooseberries and pick off the black eye but not the stalk then set them over the fire in a pot of water to scold cover them very close but not boil or break and when they are tender take them up into cold water then take a pound and a half of double refined sugar to a pound of gooseberries and clarify the sugar with water a pint to a pound of sugar and when your syrup is cold put the gooseberries single in your preserving pan 
put the syrup to them and set them on a gentle fire let them boil but not too fast lest they break and when they have boiled and you perceive that the sugar has entered them take them off cover them with white paper and set them by till the next day then take them out of the syrup and boil the syrup till it begins to be ropey skim it and put it to them again then set them on a gentle fire and let them simmer gently till you perceive the syrup will rope then take them off set them by till they are cold cover them with paper then boil some gooseberries in fair water and when the liquor is strong enough strain it out let it stand to settle and to every pint take a pound of double refined sugar then make a jelly of it put the gooseberries in glasses when they are cold cover them with the jelly the next day paper them wet and then half dry the paper that goes in the inside it closes down better and then white paper over the glass set it in your stove or a dry place to preserve white walnuts first pare your walnuts till the white appears and nothing else you must be very careful in the doing of them that they do not turn black and as fast as you do them throw them into salt and water and let them lie till your sugar is ready take three pounds of good loaf sugar put it into your preserving pan set it over a charcoal fire and put as much water as will just wet the sugar let it boil then have ready ten or a dozen whites of eggs strained and beat up to a froth cover your sugar with the froth as it boils and skim it then boil it and skim it till it is as clear as crystal then throw in your walnuts just give them a boil till they are tender then take them out and lay them in a dish to cool when cool put them in your preserving pan and when the sugar is as warm as milk pour it over them when quite cold paper them down thus clear your sugar for all preserves apricots peaches gooseberries currants etc to preserve walnuts green wipe them very clean and lay them in strong salt and water twenty four hours then take them out and wipe them very clean have ready a skillet of water boiling throw them in let them boil a minute and take them out lay them on a coarse cloth and boil your sugar as above then just give your walnuts a scold in the sugar take them up and lay them to cool put them in your preserving pot and pour on your syrup as above to preserve the large green plums first dip the stalks and leaves in boiling vinegar when they are dry have your syrup ready and first give them a scold and very carefully with a pin take off the skin boil your sugar to a candy height and dip in your plums hang them by the stalk to dry and they will look finely transparent and by hanging that way to dry will have a clear drop at the top you must take great care to clear your sugar nicely to preserve peaches take the largest peaches you can get not over ripe rub off the lint with a cloth and run them down the seam with a pin skin deep cover them with french brandy tie a bladder over them and let them stand a week make a strong syrup and boil and skim it well take the peaches out of the brandy and put them in and boil them till they look clear then take them out put them in glasses mix the syrup with the brandy and when cold pour it over your peaches tie them close down with a bladder and leather over it to make quince cakes you must let a pint of the syrup of quinces with a quart or two of raspberries be boiled and clarified over a clear gentle fire taking care that it be well skimmed from time to time then add a pound and a half of sugar cause as much more to be brought to a candy height 
and poured in hot let the whole be continually stirred about till it is almost cold then spread it on plates and cut it out into cakes end of section 35section thirty six of the art of cookery made plain and easy by hannah glass this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen to make anchovies vermicelli ketchup vinegar and to keep artichokes french beans etc to make anchovies to a peck of sprats two pounds of common salt a quarter of a pound of bay salt four pounds of saltpetre two ounces of salprunella two pennyworth of cochineal pound all in a mortar put them into a stone pot a row of sprats a layer of your compound and so on to the top alternately press them hard down cover them close let them stand six months and they will be fit for use observe that your sprats be very fresh and do not wash or wipe them but just take them as they come out of the water to pickle smelts where you have plenty take a quarter of a peck of smelts half an ounce of pepper half an ounce of nutmeg a quarter of an ounce of mace half an ounce of saltpetre a quarter of a pound of common salt beat all very fine wash and clean the smelts gut them then lay them in rows in a jar and between every layer of smelts strew the seasoning with four or five bay leaves then boil red wine and pour over them enough to cover them cover them with a plate and when cold tie them down close they exceed anchovies to make vermicelli mix yolks of eggs and flour together in a pretty stiff paste so as you can work it up cleverly and roll it as thin as it is possible to roll the paste let it dry in the sun when it is quite dry with a very sharp knife cut it as thin as possible and keep it in a dry place it will run up like little worms as vermicelli does though the best way is to run it through a coarse sieve whilst the paste is soft if you want some to be made in haste dry it by the fire and cut it small it will dry by the fire in a quarter of an hour this far exceeds what comes from abroad being fresher to make ketchup take the large flaps of mushrooms gathered dry and bruise them put some at the bottom of an earthen pan strew some salt over then mushrooms then salt till you have done put in half an ounce of cloves and mace and the like of all spice let them stand six days stir them up every day then send them to the oven and bake them gently for four hours take them out and strain the liquor through a cloth or fine sieve to every gallon of liquor add a quart of red wine if not salt enough add a little more a race or two of ginger cut small boil it till one quart is wasted strain it into a pan and let it be cold pour it from the settlings bottle it and cork it tight another way to make ketchup take the large flaps and salt them as above boil the liquor strain it through a thick flannel bag to a quart of that liquor put a quart of stale beer a large stick of horseradish cut in little slips five or six bay leaves an onion stuck with twenty or thirty cloves a quarter of an ounce of mace a quarter of an ounce of nutmegs beet a quarter of an ounce of black and white pepper a quarter of an ounce of allspice and four or five races of ginger cover it close and let it simmer very softly till about one-third is wasted then strain it through a flannel bag when it is cold bottle it in pint bottles cork it close and it will keep a great while the other receipt you have in the chapter for the sea 
artichokes to keep all the year boil as many artichokes as you intend to keep boil them so as just the leaves will come out then pull off all the leaves and choke cut them from the strings lay them on a tin plate and put them in an oven where tarts are drawn let them stand till the oven is heated again take them out before the wood is put in and set them in again after the tarts are drawn so do till they are as dry as a board then put them in a paper bag and hang them in a dry place you should lay them in warm water three or four hours before you use them shifting the water often let the last water be boiling hot they will be very tender and eat as fine as fresh ones you need not dry all your bottoms at once as the leaves are good to eat so boil a dozen at a time and save the bottoms for this use to keep french beans all the year take fine young beans gather them on a very fine day have a large stone jar ready clean and dry lay a layer of salt at the bottom and then a layer of beans then salt and then beans and so on till the jar is full cover them with salt tie a coarse cloth over them and a board on that and then a weight to keep it close from all air set them in a dry cellar and when you use them cover them close again wash them you took out very clean and let them lie in soft water twenty-four hours shifting the water often when you boil them do not put any salt in the water the best way of dressing them is boil them with just the white heart of a small cabbage then drain them chop the cabbage and put both into a saucepan with a piece of butter as big as an egg rolled in flour shake a little pepper put in a quarter of a pint of good gravy let them stew ten minutes and then dish them up for a side dish you may do more or less just as you please to keep green peas till christmas take fine young peas shell them throw them into boiling water with some salt in and let them boil five or six minutes throw them into a cullender to drain then lay a cloth four or five times double on a table and spread them on dry them very well and have your bottles ready fill them and cover them with mutton fat tried when it is a little cool fill the necks almost to the top cork them tie a bladder and a lath over them and set them in a cool dry place when you use them boil your water put in a little salt some sugar and a piece of butter when they are boiled enough throw them into a sieve to drain then put them into a saucepan with a good piece of butter keep shaking it round all the time till the butter is melted then turn them into a dish and send them to table another way to preserve green peas gather your peas on a very dry day when they are neither old nor too young shell them and have ready some quart bottles with little mouths being well dried fill the bottles and cork them well have ready a pipkin of rosin melted into which dip the necks of the bottles and set them in a very dry place that is cool to keep green gooseberries till christmas pick your large green gooseberries on a dry day have ready your bottles clean and dry fill the bottles and cork them set them in a kettle of water up to the neck let the water boil very softly till you find the gooseberries are coddled take them out and put in the rest of the bottles till all are done then have ready some rosin melted in a pipkin dip the necks of the bottles in and that will keep all air from coming at the cork keep them in a cold dry place where no damp is and they will bake as red as a cherry you may keep them without scalding but then the skins will not be so tender nor bake so fine to keep red gooseberries pick them when full ripe to each quart of gooseberries put a quarter of a pound of lisbon sugar and to each quarter of a pound of sugar 
put a quarter of a pint of water let it boil then put in your gooseberries and let them boil softly two or three minutes then pour them into little stone jars when cold cover them up and keep them for use they make fine pies with little trouble you may press them through a cullender to a quart of pulp put half a pound of fine lisbon sugar keep stirring over the fire till both be well mixed and boiled and pour it into a stone jar when cold cover it with white paper and it makes very pretty tarts or puffs to keep walnuts all the year take a large jar a layer of sea sand at the bottom then a layer of walnuts then sand then the nuts and so on till the jar is full and be sure they do not touch each other in any of the layers when you would use them lay them in warm water for an hour shift the water as it cools then rub them dry and they will peel well and eat sweet lemons will keep thus covered better than any other way another way to keep lemons take the fine large fruit that are quite sound and good and take a fine pack thread about a quarter of a yard long run it through the hard nib at the end of the lemon then tie the string together and hang it on a little hook in an airy dry place so do many as you please but be sure they do not touch one another nor anything else but hang as high as you can thus you may keep pears etc only tying the string to the stalk to keep white bullace pear plums or damsons etc for tarts or pies gather them when full grown and just as they begin to turn pick all the largest out save about two-thirds of the fruit the other third put as much water to as you think will cover the rest let them boil and skim them when the fruit is boiled very soft then strain it through a coarse hair sieve and to every quart of this liquor put a pound and a half of sugar boil it and skim it very well then throw in your fruit just give them a scold take them off the fire and when cold put them into bottles with wide mouths pour your syrup over them lay a piece of white paper over them and cover them with oil be sure to take the oil well off when you use them and do not put them in larger bottles than you think you shall make use of at a time because all these sorts of fruits spoil with the air to make vinegar to every gallon of water put a pound of coarse lisbon sugar let it boil and keep skimming it as long as the scum rises then pour it into tubs and when it is as cold as beer to work toast a good toast and rub it over with yeast let it work twenty-four hours then have ready a vessel iron hooped and well painted fixed in a place where the sun has full power and fix it so as not to have any occasion to move it when you draw it off then fill your vessels lay a tile on the bung to keep the dust out make it in march and it will be fit to use in june or july draw it off into little stone bottles the latter end of june or beginning of july let it stand till you want to use it and it will never foul any more but when you go to draw it off and you find it is not sour enough let it stand a month longer before you draw it off for pickles to go abroad use this vinegar alone but in england you will be obliged when you pickle to put one half cold spring water to it and then it will be full sour with this vinegar you need not boil unless you please for almost any sort of pickles it will keep them quite good it will keep walnuts very fine without boiling even to go to the indies but then do not put water to it for green pickles you may pour it scalding hot on two or three times all other sort of pickles you need not boil it mushrooms 
only wash them clean dry them put them into little bottles with a nutmeg just scalded in vinegar and sliced whilst it is hot very thin and a few blades of mace then fill up the bottle with the cold vinegar and spring water pour the mutton fat tried over it and tie a bladder and leather over the top these mushrooms will not be so white but as finely tasted as if they were just gathered and a spoonful of this pickle will give sauce a very fine flavour white walnuts suckers and onions and all white pickles do in the same manner after they are ready for the pickle to fry smelts let your smelts be fresh caught wipe them very dry with a cloth beat up yolks of eggs and rub over them strew crumb of bread on have some clear dripping boiling in a frying pan and fry them quick of a fine gold colour put them on a plate to drain and then lay them in your dish garnish with fried parsley with plain butter in a cup to dress white bait take your white bait fresh caught and put them in a cloth with a handful of flour and shake them about till they are separated and quite dry have some hog's lard boiling quick fry them two minutes drain them and dish up with plain butter and soy to roast a pound of butter lay it in salt and water two or three hours then spit it and rub it all over with crumbs of bread with a little grated nutmeg lay it to the fire and as it roasts baste it with the yolks of two eggs and then with crumbs of bread all the time it is a roasting but have ready a pint of oysters stewed in their own liquor and lay in the dish under the butter when the bread has soaked up all the butter brown the outside and lay it on your oysters your fire must be very slow End of section thirty six Section 37 of The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 of Distilling. To distill walnut water. Take a peck of fine green walnuts, bruise them well in a large mortar, put them in a pan with a handful of baum bruised, put two quarts of good French brandy to them cover them close and let them lie three days the next day distill them in a cold still from this quantity draw three quarts which you may do in a day how to use this ordinary still you must lay the plate then wood ashes thick at the bottom then the iron pan which you are to fill with your walnuts and liquor then put on the head of the still make a pretty brisk fire till the still begins to drop then slacken it so as just to have enough to keep the still at work mind all the time to keep a wet cloth all over the head of the still all the time it is at work and always observe not to let the still work longer than the liquor is good and take great care you do not burn the still and thus you may distill what you please if you draw the still too far it will burn and give your liquor a bad taste to make treacle water take the juice of green walnuts four pounds of rue carduus marigold and baum of each three pounds roots of butterbur half a pound roots of burdock one pound angelica and masterwort of each half a pound leaves of scordium six handfuls fenestrecle and mithridate of each half a pound old canary wine two pounds white wine vinegar six pounds juice of lemon six pounds and distill this in an alembic to make black cherry water take six pounds of black cherries and bruise them small then put to them the tops of rosemary sweet marjoram spearmint angelica baum 
marigold flowers of each a handful dried violets one ounce aniseeds and sweet fennel seeds of each half an ounce bruised cut the herbs small mix all together and distill them off in a cold still to make hysterical water take betony roots of lovage seeds of wild parsnips of each two ounces roots of single peony four ounces of mistletoe of the oak three ounces myrrh a quarter of an ounce castor half an ounce beat all these together and add to them a quarter of a pound of dried millipedes pour on these three quarts of mugwort water and two quarts of brandy let them stand in a close vessel eight days then distill it in a cold still pasted up you may draw off nine pints of water and sweeten it to your taste mix all together and bottle it up to distill red rosebuds wet your roses in fair water four gallons of roses will take near two gallons of water then still them in a cold still take the same stilled water and put into it as many fresh roses as it will wet then still them again mint balm parsley and penny royal water distill the same way to make plague water from the following types of ingredients being roots flowers and seeds roots used in plague water angelica dragon maywort mint rue carduus origany winter savoury broad thyme rosemary pimpernel sage fumitory coltsfoot scabious borage saxifrage betony liverwort germander flowers used in plague water wormwood succory hyssop agrimony fennel cowslips poppies plantain set foil vein, maidenhair motherwort cowage golden rod gromwell dill seeds used in plague water hart's tongue whorehound fennel melilot st john's wort comfrey feverfew red rose leaves wood sorrel pellitory of the wall heartsease centauri sea drink a good handful of each of the aforesaid things gentian root dock root butterbur root peony root bayberries juniper berries of each of these a pound one ounce of nutmegs one ounce of cloves and half an ounce of mace pick the herbs and flowers and shred them a little cut the roots bruise the berries and pound the spices fine take a peck of green walnuts and chop them small mix all these together and lay them to steep in sack lees or any white wine lees if not in good spirits but wine lees are best let them lie a week or better be sure to stir them once a day with a stick and keep them close covered then still them in an alembic with a slow fire and take care your still does not burn the first second and third running is good and some of the fourth let them stand till cold then put them together to make surfeit water you must take scurvy grass brook lime watercresses roman wormwood rue mint balm sage clivers of each one handful green mary two handfuls poppies if fresh half a peck if dry a quarter of a peck cochineal six pennyworth saffron six pennyworth aniseeds caraway seeds coriander seeds cardamom seeds of each an ounce licorice two ounces scraped fig split a pound raisins of the sun stoned a pound juniper berries an ounce bruised 
nutmeg an ounce beet mace an ounce bruised sweet fennel seeds an ounce bruised a few flowers of rosemary marigold and sage flowers put all these into a large stone jar and put to them three gallons of french brandy cover it close and let it stand near the fire for three weeks stir it three times a week and be sure to keep it close stopped and then strain it off bottle your liquor and pour on the ingredients a gallon more of french brandy let it stand a week stirring it once a day then distill it in a cold still and this will make a fine white surfeit water you may make this water at any time of the year if you live at london because the ingredients are always to be had either green or dry but it is best made in summer to make milk water take two good handfuls of wormwood as much carduous as much rue four handfuls of mint as much balm half as much angelica cut these a little put them into a cold still and put to them three quarts of milk let your fire be quick till your still drops and then slacken your fire you may draw off two quarts the first quart will keep all the year how to distill vinegar you have in the chapter of pickles end of section 37section 38 of the art of cookery made plain and easy by hannah glass this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 21 how to market and the seasons of the year for butcher's meat poultry fish herbs roots etc and fruit he says in a bullock the head tongue palate the entrails are the sweetbreads kidneys skirts and tripe there is the double the roll and the reed tripe the fore quarter first is the haunch which includes the clod marrowbone shin and the sticking piece that is the neck end the next is the leg of mutton piece which has part of the blade bone then the chuck the brisket the fore ribs and the middle rib which is called the chuck rib the hind quarter first sirloin and rump the thin and thick flank the veiny piece then the isk bone or chuck bone buttock and leg in a sheep the head and pluck which includes the liver lights heart sweetbreads and melt the fore quarter the neck breast and shoulder the hind quarter the leg and loin the two loins together is called a chine of mutton which is a fine joint when it is the little fat mutton in a calf the head and inwards are the pluck which contains the heart liver lights nut and melt and what they call the skirts which eat finely broiled the throat sweetbread and the windpipe sweetbread which is the finest the forequarter is the shoulder neck and breast the hindquarter is the leg which contains the knuckle and fillet then the loin in a house lamb the head and pluck that is the liver lights heart nut and melt then there is the fry which is the sweetbreads lambstones and skirts with some of the liver the forequarter is the shoulder neck and breast together the hindquarter is the leg and loin this is in high season at christmas but lasts all the year grass lamb comes in in april or may according to the season of the year and holds good till the middle of august in a hog the head and inwards and that is the haslet which is the liver and crow kidney and skirts it is mixed with a great deal of sage and sweet herbs pepper salt and spice 
so rolled in the caul and roasted then there are the chitterling and the guts which are cleaned for sausages the forequarter is the forloin and spring if a large hog you may cut a spare rib off the hindquarter only leg and loin a bacon hog this is cut different because of making hams bacon and pickled pork here you have fine spare ribs chines and griskins and fat for hog's lard the liver and crow is much admired fried with bacon the feet and ears are both equally good soused pork comes in season at bartholomew tide and holds good till lady day how to choose butcher's meat to choose lamb in a four quarter of lamb mind the neck vein if it be an azure blue it is new and good but if greenish or yellowish it is near tainting if not tainted already in the hinder quarter smell under the kidney and try the knuckle if you meet with a faint scent and the knuckle be limber it is stale killed for a lamb's head mind the eyes if they be sunk or wrinkled it is stale if plump and lively it is new and sweet veal if the bloody vein in the shoulder looks blue or a bright red it is new killed but if blackish greenish or yellowish it is flabby and stale if wrapped in wet cloths smell whether it be musty or not the loin first taints under the kidney and the flesh if stale killed will be soft and slimy the breast and neck taints first at the upper end and you will perceive some dusky yellowish greenish appearance the sweetbread on the breast will be clammy otherwise it is fresh and good the leg is known to be new by the stiffness of the joint if limber and the flesh seems clammy and has green or yellowish specks it is stale the head is known as the lambs the flesh of a bull calf is more red and firm than that of a cow calf and the fat more hard and curdled mutton if the mutton be young the flesh will pinch tender if old it will wrinkle and remain so if young the fat will easily part from the lean if old it will stick by strings and skins if ram mutton the fat feels spongy the flesh close-grained and tough not rising again when dented with your finger if you mutton the flesh is paler than wedder mutton a closer grain and easily parting if there be a rot the flesh will be palish and the fat a faint whitish inclining to yellow and the flesh will be loose at the bone if you squeeze it hard some drops of water will stand up like sweat as to the newness and staleness the same is to be observed as by lamb beef if it be right ox beef it will have an open grain if young a tender and oily smoothness if rough and spongy it is old or inclining to be so except neck brisket and such parts as are very fibrous which in young meat will be more rough than in other parts a carnation pleasant colour betokens good spending meat the suet a curious white yellowish is not so good cow beef is less bound and closer grained than the ox the fat whiter but the lean somewhat paler if young the dent you make with your finger will rise again in a little time bull beef is of a close grain deep dusky red tough in pinching the fat skinny hard and has a ramish rank smell and for newness and staleness this flesh bought fresh has but few signs the more material is its clamminess and the rest your smell will inform you if it be bruised these places will look more dusky or blackish than the rest 
cork if it be young the lean will break in pinching between your fingers and if you nip the skin with your nails it will make a dent also if the fat be soft and pulpy in a manner like lard if the lean be tough and the fat flabby and spongy feeling rough it is old especially if the rind be stubborn and you cannot nip it with your nails if of a boar though young or of a hog gelded at full growth the flesh will be hard tough reddish and ramish of smell the fat skinny and hard the skin very thick and tough and pinched up will immediately fall again as for old and new killed try the legs hands and springs by putting your finger under the bone that comes out for if it be tainted you will there find it by smelling your finger besides the skin will be sweaty and clammy when stale but cool and smooth when new if you find little kernels in the fat of the pork like hail shot if many it is measly and dangerous to be eaten how to choose brawn venison westphalia hams etc brawn is known to be old or young by the extraordinary or moderate thickness of the rind the thick is old the moderate is young if the rind and fat be very tender it is not boar brawn but barrow or sow venison try the haunches or shoulders under the bones that come out with your finger or knife and as the scent is sweet or rank it is new or stale and the like of the sides in the most fleshy parts if tainted they will look greenish in some places or more than ordinary black look on the hooves and if the clefts are very wide and rough it is old if close and smooth it is young the season for venison the buck venison begins in may and is in high season till all hallows day the doe is in season from michaelmas to the end of december or sometimes to the end of january westphalia hams and english bacon put a knife under the bone that sticks out of the ham and if it comes out in a manner clean and has a curious flavour it is sweet and good if much smeared and dulled it is tainted or rusty english gammons are tried the same way and for other parts try the fat if it be white oily in feeling does not break or crumble good but if the contrary and the lean has some little streaks of yellow it is rusty or will soon be so to choose butter cheese and eggs when you buy butter trust not to that which will be given you to taste but try in the middle and if your smell and taste be good you cannot be deceived cheese is to be chosen by its moist and smooth coat if old cheese be rough coated rugged or dry at top beware of little worms or mites if it be over full of holes moist or spongy it is subject to maggots if any soft or perished place appear on the outside try how deep it goes for the greater part may be hid within eggs hold the great end to your tongue if it feels warm be sure it is new if cold it is bad and so in proportion to the heat and cold so is the goodness of the egg another way to know a good egg is to put the egg into a pan of cold water the fresher the egg the sooner it will fall to the bottom if rotten it will swim at the top this is also a sure way not to be deceived as to the keeping of them pitch them all with the small end downwards in fine wood ashes turning them once a week endways and they will keep some months poultry in season january hen turkeys capons pullets with eggs 
fowls chickens hares all sorts of wild fowl tame rabbits and tame pigeons february turkeys and pullets with eggs capons fowls small chickens hares all sorts of wild fowl which in this month begin to decline tame and wild pigeons tame rabbits green geese young ducklings and turkey poults march this month the same as the preceding month and in this month wild fowl goes quite out april pullets spring fowls chickens pigeons young wild rabbits leverets young geese ducklings and turkey poults may and june the same july the same with young partridges pheasants and wild ducks called flappers or malters august the same september october november and december in these months all sorts of fowl both wild and tame are in season and in the three last is the full season for all manner of wild fowl how to choose poultry to know whether a capon is a true one young or old new or stale if he be young his spurs are short and his legs smooth if a true capon a fat vein on the side of his breast the comb pale and a thick belly and rump if new he will have a close hard vent if stale a loose open vent a cock or hen turkey turkey poults if the cock be young his legs will be black and smooth and his spurs short if stale his eyes will be sunk in his head and the feet dry if new the eyes lively and feet limber observe the like by the hen and moreover if she be with egg she will have a soft open vent if not a hard close vent turkey poults are known the same way and their age cannot deceive you a cock hen etc if young his spurs are short and dubbed but take particular notice they are not paired nor scraped if old he will have an open vent but if new a close hard vent and so of a hen for newness or staleness if old her legs and comb are rough if young smooth a tame goose wild goose and bran goose if the bill be yellowish and she has but few hairs she is young but if full of hairs and the bill and foot red she is old if new limber footed if stale dry footed and so of a wild goose and bran goose wild and tame ducks the duck when fat is hard and thick on the belly but if not thin and lean if new limber footed if stale dry footed a true wild duck has a reddish foot smaller than the tame one godwits marl knots ruffs gull dotterels and wheat ears if these be old their legs will be rough if young smooth if fat a fat rump if new limber footed if stale dry footed pheasant cock and hen the cock when young has dubbed spurs when old sharp small spurs if new a fat vent and if stale an open flabby one the hen if young has smooth legs and her flesh of a curious grain if with egg she will have a soft open vent and if not a close one for newness or staleness as the cock heath and pheasant poults if new they will be stiff and white in the vent and the feet limber if fat they will have a hard vent if stale dry footed and limber and if touched they will peel heathcock and hen if young they have smooth legs and bills 
and if old rough for the rest they are known as the foregoing partridge cock and hen the bill white and the legs bluish shoe age for if young the bill is black and the legs yellowish if new a fast vent if stale a green and open one if their crops be full and they have fed on green wheat they may taint there and for this smell in their mouth woodcock and snipe the woodcock if fat is thick and hard if new limber footed when stale dry footed or if their noses are snotty and their throats muddy and moorish they are naught a snipe if fat has a fat vein in the side under the wing and in the vent feels thick for the rest like the woodcock doves and pigeons to know the turtle dove look for a bluish ring round his neck and the rest mostly white the stock dove is bigger and the ring dove is less than the stock dove the dove house pigeons when old are red-legged if new and fat they will feel full and fat in the vent and are limber footed but if stale a flabby and green vent and so green or grey plover field fare blackbird thrush larks etc of hare leveret or rabbit hare will be whitish and stiff if new and clean killed if stale the flesh blackish in most parts and the body limber if the cleft in her lips spread very much and her claws wide and ragged she is old and the contrary young if the hair be young the ears will tear like a piece of brown paper if old dry and tough to know a true leveret feel on the foreleg near the foot and if there be a small bone or knob it is right if not it is a hair for the rest observe as in a hair a rabbit if stale will be limber and slimy if new white and stiff if old her claws are very long and rough the wool mottled with grey hairs if young the claws and wool smooth fish in season candlemas quarter lobsters crabs crawfish river crawfish guardfish mackerel bream barbel roach shad or alloc lamprey or lampereels dace bleak prawns and horse mackerel the eels that are taken in running water are better than pond eels of these the silver ones are most esteemed midsummer quarter turbots and trouts soles grigs and shafflings and glout teens salmon dolphin flying fish sheephead tollis both land and sea sturgeon seal chub lobsters and crabs sturgeon is a fish commonly found in the northern seas but now and then we find them in our great rivers the thames the severn and the tyne this fish is of a very large size and will sometimes measure eighteen feet in length they are much esteemed when fresh cut in pieces roasted baked or pickled for cold treats the caviar is esteemed a dainty which is the spawn of this fish the latter end of this quarter comes smelts michaelmas quarter cod and haddock coalfish white and pelting hake ling tusk and mullet red and grey weaver gurnet rocket herrings sprats soles and flounders plaice dabs and smear dabs eels chars skate thornback and homlin kinson oysters and scallops sea perch and carp pike tench and sea tench skate maids are black and thornback maids white 
grey bass comes with the mullet in this quarter are fine smelts and hold till after christmas there are two sorts of mullets the sea mullet and river mullet both equally good christmas quarter dory brile gudgeons gollin smelts crouch perch anchovy and loach scallop and wilkes periwinkles cockles mussels gear bearbet and hollebet how to choose fish to choose salmon pike trout carp tench grayling barbel chub ruff eel whiting smelt shad etc all these are known to be new or stale by the colour of their gills and the easiness or hardness to open the hanging or keeping up of their fins the standing out or sinking of their eyes etc and by smelling their gills turbot he is chosen by his thickness and plumpness and if his belly be of a cream colour he must spend well but if thin and his belly of a bluish white he will eat very loose cod and codling choose him by his thickness towards his head and the whiteness of his flesh when it is cut and so of a codling ling for dried ling choose that which is thickest in the pole and the flesh of the brightest yellow skate and thornback these are chosen by their thickness and the she skate is the sweetest especially if large soles these are chosen by their thickness and stiffness when their bellies are of a cream colour they spend the firmer sturgeon if it cuts without crumbling and the veins and gristles give a true blue where they appear and the flesh a perfect white then conclude it to be good fresh herrings and mackerel if their gills are of a lively shining redness and their eyes stand full and the fish is stiff then they are new but if dusky and faded or sinking and ringled and tails limber they are stale lobsters choose them by their weight the heaviest are best if no water be in them if new the tail will pull smart like a spring if full the middle of the tail will be full of hard or reddish skin meat cock lobster is known by the narrow back part of the tail and the two uppermost fins within his tail are stiff and hard but the hen is soft and the back of her tail broader prawns shrimps and crab fish the two first if stale will be limber and cast a kind of slimy smell their colour fading and they slimy the latter will be limber in their claws and joints their red colour turn blackish and dusky and will have an ill smell under their throats otherwise all of them are good place and flounders if they are stiff and their eyes be not sunk or look dull they are new the contrary when stale the best sort of place look bluish on the belly pickled salmon if the flesh feels oily and the scales are stiff and shining and it comes in flakes and parts without crumbling then it is new and good and not otherwise pickled and red herrings for the first open the back to the bone and if the flesh be white sleeky and oily and the bones white or a bright red they are good if red herrings carry a good gloss part well from the bone and smell well then conclude them to be good fruits and garden stuff throughout the year january fruits yet lasting are some grapes the kentish russet golden french curtain and dutch pippins john apples winter queenings the marigold and harvey apples pom water 
golden dorset renneting love's pearmain and the winter pearmain winter bergamot winter boncretian winter mask winter norwich and great serene pears all garden things much the same as in december february fruits yet lasting the same as in january except the golden pippin and pom water also the pomery and the winter peppering and dagobent pear march fruits yet lasting the golden ducat dorset pippins rennetings love's pearmain and john apples the latter boncretian and double blossom pear april fruits yet lasting you have now in the kitchen garden and orchard autumn carrots winter spinach sprouts of cabbage and cauliflowers turnip tops asparagus young radishes dutch brown lettuce and cresses burnet young onions scallions leeks and early kidney beans on hotbeds purslane cucumbers and mushrooms some cherries green apricots and gooseberries for tarts pippins de on westbury apple russeting gillyflower the latter boncretian oak pear etc may the product of the kitchen and fruit garden asparagus cauliflowers imperial silesia royal and cabbage lettuces burnet purslane cucumbers nasturtium flowers peas and beans sown in october artichokes scarlet strawberries and kidney beans upon the hotbeds may cherries may dukes on walls green apricots and gooseberries pippins devons or john apple westbury apples russeting gillyflower apples the codlin etc the great carvile winter boncretian black worcester pear sarin and double blossom pear now is the proper time to distil herbs which are in their greatest perfection june the product of the kitchen and fruit garden asparagus garden beans and peas kidney beans cauliflowers artichokes battersea and dutch cabbage melons on their first ridges young onions carrots and parsnips sown in february purslane borage burnet the flowers of nasturtium the dutch brown the imperial the royal the silesia and cos lettuces some blanched endive and cucumbers and all sorts of pot herbs green gooseberries strawberries some raspberries currants white and black duke cherries red hearts the flemish and carnation cherries codlins janetings and the masculine apricot and in the forcing frames all the forward kind of grapes july the product of the kitchen and fruit garden roncival and winged pears garden and kidney beans cauliflowers cabbages artichokes and their small suckers all sorts of kitchen and aromatic herbs salads such as cabbage lettuce purslane burnet young onions cucumbers blanched endive carrots turnips beets nasturtium flowers musk melons wood strawberries currants gooseberries raspberries red and white janetings the margaret apple the primate russet summer green chisel and pearl pears the carnation morella great bearer morocco origate and beggaro cherries the nutmeg isabella persian newington violet muscal and rambouille peaches nectarines the primordial myrobalant red blue amber damask pear apricot and cinnamon plums also the king's and lady elizabeth's plums etc some figs and grapes 
walnuts in high season to pickle and rock samphire the fruit yet lasting of the last year is the de on and winter russeting august the product of the kitchen and fruit garden cabbages and their sprouts cauliflowers artichokes cabbage lettuces beets carrots potatoes turnip some beans peas kidney beans and all sorts of kitchen herbs radishes horseradish cucumbers cresses some tarragon onions garlic rocamboles melons and cucumbers for pickling gooseberries raspberries currants grapes figs mulberries and filberts apples the windsor sovereign orange bergamot slipper red catherine king catherine penny prussian summer poppening sugar and louding pears crown bordeaux laveur disput savoy and wellacotta peaches the maroi tawny red roman little green cluster and yellow nectarines imperial blue dates yellow late pear black pear white nutmeg late pear great antony or turkey and jane plums cluster muscadine and cornelian grapes september the product of the kitchen and fruit garden garden and some kidney beans roncival peas artichokes radishes cauliflowers cabbage lettuce cresses chervil onions tarragon burnet celery endive mushrooms carrots turnips skirrets beets scorzonera horseradish garlic shallots rocambole cabbage and their sprouts with savoys which are better when more sweetened with the frost peaches grapes figs pears plums walnuts filberts almonds quinces melons and cucumbers october the product of the kitchen and fruit garden some cauliflowers artichokes peas beans cucumbers and melons also july sown kidney beans turnips carrots parsnips potatoes skirrets scores and era beets onions garlic shallots rocambole chardons cresses chervil mustard radish rape spinach lettuce small and cabbage burnet tarragon blanched celery and endive late peaches and plums grapes and figs mulberries filberts and walnuts the bullace pines and arbutus and great variety of apples and pears november the product of the kitchen and fruit garden cauliflowers in the greenhouse and some artichokes carrots parsnips turnips beets skirrets scores and era horseradish potatoes onions garlic shallots rocambole celery parsley sorrel thyme savoury sweet marjoram dry and clary cabbages and their sprouts savoy cabbage spinach late cucumbers hot herbs on the hotbed burnet cabbage lettuce endive blanched several sorts of apples and pears some bullaces medlars arbutas walnuts hazelnuts and chestnuts december the product of the kitchen and fruit garden many sorts of cabbages and savoys spinach and some cauliflowers in the conservatory and artichokes in sand roots we have as in the last month small herbs on the hotbeds for salads also mint tarragon and cabbage lettuce preserved under glasses chervil celery and endive blanched sage thyme savoury beet leaves tops of young beets parsley sorrel spinach leeks and sweet marjoram marigold flowers and mint dried 
asparagus on the hotbed and cucumbers on the plants sown in july and august and plenty of pears and apples end of section thirty eight